This is Just Something About Her, a podcast from The Recount and iHeartRadio. I often say, if you're not married to the first person you had sex with, thank birth control and abortion, because that means that you made some decisions that you could, like, really get clear on. Hi, I'm Jennifer Palmieri. On this podcast, I talk to powerful women about how they made it to the top on their own terms. This week's guest, Liz Winstead. Liz Winstead, welcome to Just Something About Her. Delightful to have you. I am thrilled to be here. Um, Today's episode is about how everything has changed, but also nothing has changed. (laughs) And... (laughs) Uh, prior to getting on, I was just um, read a story uh, from CNBC uh, that said that Tina Flournoy, uh, Kamala Harris's chief of staff, uh, Tina is a good friend of mine, that uh, she was a big problem because all of the Democratic donors who used to, when uh, the vice president was a senator, had a good, had, you know, could just call Kamala Harris and she would pick up. Now they have to go through Tina, and you know somehow this is like reflects very badly on Tina. <laughs> It's like, also known as doing her job, right? Also known as, uh, sometimes you need somebody to help you figure out what's happening in your day when you're the second most powerful person in the nation. And you, I'm sorry that if I don't pick up my phone for you, like, honestly, it is how we get up every day and don't just punch a wall, or maybe we do secretly. Yeah. But it is utterly shocking. I know we don't because we all women would just walk around with giant purple bruises on their face from just like smacking. <laughs> yeah, we have our ways. We have ways. Of, we have our ways of fighting back. But it was just like it was just classic. You know, a classic example of like how everything's changed. We have a woman as president. We have a black woman as president. We have a black woman as our chief of staff. Um, but this like trope that the woman chief of staff is somehow a problem that she's hiding things that she's protecting the boss and shouldn't be doing that as you know as if that's not her job but <laughs> the same goes about how everything has changed and nothing has changed for women in comedy um, and that goes for the fight for reproductive rights I mean we think I feel like in you know with you in particular it's interesting to have a conversation about both Hollywood women's power representation influence and then also a alongside that reproductive rights, which is sort of, you know, your life story of those two things coming um, together. When we started the fight for, we'll start with reproductive rights and then dovetail into comedy, it was, it was, it was and still is so often people without uteruses who seem to understand how capacity, parenthood, how the body works, what should happen, and how it will benefit them to make sure they're controlling us, right? And so when we started the fight, it was like, please don't weigh in, we don't need you. Um, And I think part of that was just gaining our own power. And now, in order for us to win this fight, A, we have to really change hearts and minds when we're talking about reproductive care and abortion to refocus it back into an option that somebody might have in their reproductive lifetime about the care, or about some kind of medical decision that they're gonna make. And that if we take away people's options for care that they know they need, that's everybody's problem because then that comes into not being able to help people on a path to destiny. It becomes a human rights issue. And I think that as as getting men to stand behind that and understand that fulfilling relationships with everybody who could be oppressed by not being able to get the care they need doesn't serve anyone, you know, birth control, all of it, men have benefited greatly from access to birth control, access to abortion. You know, how many men have great stories? Like I often say, if you're not married to the first person you had sex with, thank birth control and abortion, because that means that you made some decisions that you could like really get clear on. So I think that needs to be a reframing. And then when it comes to comedy, you know, it's like, I feel like, thank God for all of the problems we do have with Um, social media and the internet, it was the great equalizer for women to get their power. When you look at men executives, and to a certain extent still today, Mm -hmm. who would allow agency of women to tell their stories on TV, in stand-up, in sketch comedy shows, men were like, but are guys going to think your experience is funny? You know? (laughs) Yeah. Instead of like, Well, we as women have often laughed at stuff that we've never gone through that men have brought to the party because 
their stories were the only ones being told. Because they centered themselves in it, yeah. Yeah, and so to act like men can't hear a different experience and hear a hilarious story navigated, mm-hmm. like, is insulting to men and right. insulting to women both, right? And so now that we were able to create our own path and now more women are at the table, as we all know, it it that's where you need to be in the decision-making places. We don't want to just be the dancing monkeys and have somebody uh-huh. decide what when the dance is good or bad. Mm-hmm. We have to be the ones saying, the dance is relevant and it's great and we're gonna love it and it's amazing. So, but we still have a long way to go. What else needs to happen for more women to be writing in Hollywood? I think that and there needs to be more women executives that understand the story are valuable and interesting and also understand that um, it shouldn't be acceptable to have those rooms be dominated by men. And it's not that women aren't bringing these stories forward. Women are writing amazing stuff all the time. And it's not, you know, I, I mean, I just finally said, I'm going to make things and put them in spaces where I land. I mean, I couldn't get a Netflix special to save my life to do my stand-up. There's plenty of men my age who have Netflix specials. I'm hilarious. So I made my own special last year. Right. And, and, you know, but I'm just, it's like, I'm just not going to sit around and wait for agency. But I I do think that part of the problem is, you know, just education too. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't think people know that Queen's Gambit and Mare of East Town was I written didn't know all that. by men. I yeah. did not know that. It's fucking shocking. Oh my god! I was like, watched episode of Mare of East Town. I'm like, oh, this is so amazing. Who wrote it? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. That is wild. I did not know that. Yeah. Ugh. So when you when they all get the Emmys, you'll see them all walk up up on stage, and like women think we can't do that. We think we don't know how to do that. We think, and you just have to. You have to. You know, you you know, it's like this is it, ladies. We are the generation of women who are on the earth right now who are either going to change it mm-hmm. or it will forever be really great, talented, nice men who are telling women's stories. Really, you know, I mean, I love Queen's Gambit, love Mary Town, um, love Kate Winslet. Kate Winslet was the one woman who was a co-executive producer <laughs> on the Mary Town. But it's not going to change if we don't like, you know, start doing it ourselves. And you got right. platforms to do it, even if you can't get your Netflix fetch. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, go. and that's the whole thing. Put it out there any way you can. My dedication to the facts is even bigger than my dedication to the humor, because I want to be a reliable narrator, even if I am cracking jokes in between information. So tell me about, um, you know, you started Lady Parts Justice League. Yep. So tell, you know, and I know that you have recently renamed it. Mm-hmm. I think that concern about, um, uh, you know, trans women and um, is um, part of the reason why. But tell me, like, why you started Lady Parts Justice League yeah. to begin with and the evolution that it's gone through, because I, I think that sort of reflects a you know broader evolution in the um, issue too. Yeah, well, it's interesting because in my career, uh, my comedy has always been responding to social issues. It became very political um, during the first Gulf War when I realized and was watching the media. And, and then I started sort of this journey on, you know, I created The Daily Show and launched Air America Radio. But in the course of doing those two specific things, um, even in progressive spaces Mm -hmm. and liberal spaces, there was still, if you wanted to talk about some outrageous thing that was happening around abortion, uh, you couldn't. The the powers that be, my bosses were almost always men. And they were like, again, oh, you know what? That's just so... Yeah. And I was like, it's also really important. (laughs) And so when all of this stuff started happening in 2012, I had just finished my book and I had just come off uh, Air America and I didn't know what I wanted to do next. And it was when all those laws started happening and they were dropped. And Say more about those laws. So I think everybody remembers Wendy Davis in Texas in those Mm -hmm. sneakers filibustering. 
What a lot of folks I don't think realize is that 26 other states dropped that same bucket of laws. Yep. But not everybody had a Wendy Davis. So right. clinics started closing profoundly and yep. quickly. And I was like, this is unreal. And I I was thinking to myself, what do I want to do next? So I hopped in a van. I was in Minnesota with my right. two dogs. That's where you're from. I, that's where I'm from. That's where Are I am you there now? now? I am. Oh, it looks yeah. pretty. It Thank looks you. Beautiful. Yeah. And uh, I, I drove across country doing benefits along the way. And I did 187 benefits in a year and a half for Planned Parenthood Independent Clinics and NARAL. I would visit the clinics. And the thing that I heard every time from the clinics were, they were surprised that I came. Mm -hmm. And they said, why are you here? Thank you for coming, no one ever comes. Mm. And it broke my heart, it really broke my heart. And when I went to Michigan, um, I met a state rep named Lisa Brown, who was, they were trying to push this trans, forced transvaginal ultrasound bill in Michigan. Mm -hmm. where it was, if you needed an abortion, the state wanted to mandate that you had an unnecessary transvaginal ultrasound. And it's yeah. akin to state sexual assault. So Lisa was on the floor of the state house. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I'm flattered that you're all so interested in my vagina, but no means no. And her speaker, Republican speaker, stood up and said, Stop saying vagina, it's offensive. Use something that's more palatable, like lady parts. <laughs> and Lisa said... I did not know this was the origin of the story. Lisa said, are you telling me you have the right to legislate a vagina and you can't say it? And if she would have had a vibrator in her hand, she would have dropped it as a mic drop and walked <laughs> right out. But then she did, and I met Lisa, and it was such an inspiring story that... We called the organization Lady Parts Justice, you know, and it was funny and it was good and it was a great origin story. But truth be told, for those who need care, who um, don't identify as women or ladies and their, and mm -hmm. you know, their reproductive organs are not in any way indicative of their gender, uh, it felt, it just felt um, alienating. And I was like, I heard people, I was like, that's the last thing I want to do. So right. I'm happy to change the name. Change it. I right. want everybody right. Is this like to an come. Evol it's an evolution. You know, it's progress, right? It's progress. You can't, we can't stay in the same place and yeah. expect things to change, or 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 or, or um, reject people who are willing to change. You know, 100%. which I feel like sometimes also happens. Yeah. So it's been really great. And so what we do is, for those that don't mm -hmm. know about the organization, is we travel around the country. And we do, it's sort of a cross between a USO show and Habitats for Humanity for the people who are providing care. So we do big shows in cities uh, where we have, a com we have comedy and music, and then we do conversations with the providers and the activists in those local communities. Mm -hmm. And they tell the stories of what they need. And then our audience hears about it and they get to sign up right in the room to volunteer. And then they learn about the issues that are happening in their state and then they can really do it. And then we go to the clinic and we do work at the clinic because what a lot of folks don't know is if you provide care in Alabama, Oklahoma, Arkansas, uh, you can't get a landscaper to come to your clinic because you provide abortion. You mm, can't get someone mm -hmm. to fix your roof. Mm -hmm. So we will yep. go in and do those things. This and is so smart. It's so fun. And then what we do is, which is really great, is we'll fix their immediate need. But then we tell the story of their needs to our audience. Mm -hmm. And every single time I got a landscaper who signs up. And I remember this guy saying, are you saying that if I get a client and get paid, that's activism? And I was like, <laughs> yes, by you parking your van in front of that clinic. You're saying I support these people in the community and politicians listen to that and yep. the community listens to that and you've done an amazing thing and you've made some money. You're welcome. I'm here to help everybody. So uh, <laughs> so you got entertainment, activism, and then it's like community building because these are people you're it's in their own community. They're yes. like meeting each other, yep. learning how to support the yep. people that are running the clinics. That's right. And so yeah, it's now pretty ingenious. it's so fun. And what we're doing this fall, which I'm really excited about is we're launching a talk show on YouTube called Feminist Buzzkills Live, where it's going to be kind of a, a version of this a weekly show where we will be talking to activists on the ground and we'll be talking to um, 
We'll be talking to providers, but we'll have comedy and music as well and a call to action so that folks can really learn about the issue. So go to our YouTube. It's Abortion Access Front and then um, subscribe so because you don't want to miss it because we're having great we're going to have like all your favorite comics because we've had so many of them on the road and it's really mm-hmm. changed them forever like when you hear like to Mark, go and hear people's stories yeah yeah turns and out to that tell matters, their own yeah. and turns out that the fear for so long was if you told your abortion story that you would get blackballed or that you wouldn't get mm-hmm. work Right. And now that those of us are coming forward and telling and ha ha, no black balls, yeah. um, it, it encourages other people to do it. And right. so, you know, it's going to be a raucous lot of language and uh, but truth telling. And like one of the things that I have done since Daily Show and Air America is like my dedication to the facts is even bigger than my dedication to the humor because... Mm-hmm. I want to be a reliable narrator, even if I am cracking jokes in between right, information. Right, which you can do, which you can be both things, right? Yes. That was, yeah. When did you decide that you needed to speak out more about it? I think I needed, I think I learned when I, um, when I realized that I was able to access an abortion without a whole lot of drama when I had it, it was, um, I was young. Yeah, you were in high school, right? I was in, well, I was in high school. And I, and I ended up at a fit, one of these fake pregnancy centers first. That part was traumatic. Having, oh, the ones that advertise as if, come if you're in trouble, but yes. it's. And you get there and what they do is, um, it's literally people who are not medical professionals dressed up in a lab coat, oh. using language. Um, this was in 1979 and I'll never forget. I was terrified. And she said, you know, abortion's against our law. And she, she meant the law of her church. Right. Because abortion was legalized in 1973. Right. And so I heard against the law, so I thought it was breaking the law. And right. I was like, I don't know what to do. And I said, I'm, I feel really confused about what my choices are. And she said, your choices are mommy or murder. Oh, my God. And I'm a teenager, right? And, right. and at that point... And then I and I accessed the abortion. And the interesting part of the abortion story is that the abortion wasn't very interesting. When I went to the clinic, there were so many caring people who just asked me questions about what my goals and dreams and hopes were for my life. And that's interesting. Do you feel like they were trained to do that? That that was like guidance about like you need to have this young woman continue to look forward or. I think, and I think the unspoken story. Or maybe they're just smart. They were, you know what they were? <laughs> they're totally trained to. And the thing that isn't spoken about enough is folks who provide abortion care, they want you to walk out of that clinic making the decision that you want. They ask you a series of questions so that you can answer them for yourself. Mm-hmm. And maybe at some point you'll say, I actually don't think I'm ready. And I, to have an abortion, maybe I do want to carry this pregnancy, or mm-hmm. yes, you've helped me in my Some resolve. Some people made the decision. Yeah. Yep. And so it felt really right, and it felt really non-judgy. That's the world I want to live in, where we we honor all pregnancy outcomes because we value the person who's making the decision about their capacities. It's like when people often ask me, "Gosh, we hear all these bans all the time. What are the one? What's the one that you think is maybe the most horrifying?" Right. And for me, it's a waiting period, and people always go huh, that one seems like maybe a little bit like I could maybe go along with that, asking someone to think about it. And what I say is, the second someone finds out they're pregnant, they think about it constantly. They think about it all the time. They're trying to make decisions and they're thinking about it. And if we become a society that puts into our fabric that women can't be trusted in making this decision and we have to make them wait because they don't make good decisions, that becomes a belief system that transitions way out of the abortion conversation and into, can women be trusted to run my business? Can women be trusted to get a loan to start their own business? I'm unclear that women make good decisions and we do not. We should be doing everything in our power to tamp that down right right away. This is what allows um, uh, a conservatorship to keep an IUD in Britney Spears. I wanted to take the ID out so I could start trying to have another baby, but this so-called team won't let me go to the doctor 
to take it out because they they don't want me to have children any more children. Isn't this insane? I it is like talk about wanting. I mean, I I chilling chilling and like and understanding that that could be a thing. Was, uh, yeah, I was was yeah. like to me like wait, she's an adult, but wait, what? And also just, you know, it was interesting. I had a couple of people in my Twitter feed saying things like, why do we care about Britney? Why do we care about a celebrity? I was like, yeah. if that person's name was Nancy and they were from Lima, Ohio, and right. I read that story, yeah, I would be horrified and amplifying it just as hard. Yeah, you know, yeah. the I'm fact that yeah. you know Brittany was finally allowed to tell her story and talk about her anguish and talk about her challenges mentally and everything else, and to have no one looking out for Brittany, I, it was heartbreaking. Wow. Yeah. The Daily Show became powerful because the media didn't do its job. people don't know is that you were at the origins of both Air America and The Daily Show. And what yep. I know, because I've worked in political communications for a million years, is how important, you know, without Air America, MSNBC would not exist, is my view, right? So the theory of Air America is mm -hmm. that you can be, that people can listen to substance, that they will find it compelling, that they will follow along if you present it well, and that you can bring humor into it. And the other thing part is The Daily Show, which, you know, I mean, so upended the way, you know, we in the Obama White House thought about um, communications and reaching people. But what people don't know is both of these things came from Liz Winstead. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's such a huge impact you have had. I will be in any space where someone's actually going to be provocative and move the ball forward. And I don't mm -hmm. think we use the word provocative enough because I think people, our side thinks it's a dangerous word, mm -hmm. but it's not. Provocative is tapping into the realities that we often used to say, if you don't talk about them, you're giving them a platform. And I think we've made a yes. serious mistake in mm -hmm. saying, if all you're doing is talking about them, you're giving them a platform. If you are talking about them, giving a context for why they are part of the problem and then mm -hmm. helping people have a solution where they can do something about it, then you're being provocative and you're actually empowering everybody hearing the story to do something. As much as I love The Daily Show, like I did not want to be an anger fluffer only. I didn't mm -hmm. just want to be somebody who was like, bringing it up and isn't this hilarious and aren't you mad? Go to bed now, good night. <laughs> yeah, I have to tell you that uh, President Obama at times would have some concerns about, you know, what The Daily Show, understanding where they were coming from and right. understanding, you know, like where Jon Stewart was coming from. The Daily Show became powerful because the media didn't do its job. So I don't think totally. that we shouldn't be holding the Daily Show accountable for being funny. We should be holding the media accountable for the cynicism that led to the Daily Show. Well, how do you feel about the media now? How do you feel like it's doing now? I think, you know, we just need to learn, become more well-rounded as people in our information hubs. And I think, honestly, one of the things that The Daily Show and Colbert and, and John Oliver have yeah. done is, is make them think that they're supposed to be funny and have funny graphics. And it's like, no, you should just be really, really great storytellers mm -hmm. so that that Which makes John those Oliver shows is, funnier. Right? I mean, those shows are great, but the news media should, shouldn't become the comedy shows. Right, they should be. They should right. be the people who are helping break down um, other stories so that the comedy shows could be even funnier because you have a smarter electorate coming to then watch the response shows. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much. This, this was, was like, so, oh, this was so great. This is good, right? Loved it. Yeah, yeah, yay. Loved yeah. it, loved it, loved it. <laughs>